case. And what it means is that as this inflation becomes more viable to the average person, they'll start to seek ways to protect themselves. And the wealthier will look to gold and the less wealthy that have savings will move to silver. It's my pleasure to welcome David Morgan. He is publisher of The Morgan Report and best-selling author of Second Chance, How to Make and Keep Big Money from the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave. He's coming to us from Spokane, Washington. David, welcome. How are you? Jason, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you on. So metals, precious metals, have been a measuring stick for the value of everything for just forever. <laughs> what, what is going on in the metals market and what does it tell us about the economy and stocks and real estate and everything else? Well, as you said, Jason, the metals actually are a good uh, indicator of what the true value is because there's value in gold and silver in and of itself. However, if you go on to uh, off of a metal standard like we did in 1971, August 15th with Nixon, what happens is you this, go. This on. is the 50 year anniversary of that. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> that, that and and let I want to just remind everybody, David, that Nixon said he was going to temporarily <laughs> do that, suspend the convertibility of the dollar to gold, and here we are, half a century later, on this temporary thing, and and you know. It's uh, that, that was, I know I, I know it well. I've asked you know, Secretary Connolly to. Yeah. Temporarily close the gold. Yeah, yeah thank you, Tricky yeah. Dicky. Yeah. Just, so just what happens? No, temporarily. <laughs> yeah. What happens is there's a printing press frenzy, a free for all, basically, and it usually starts rather slowly, and then it morphs into what's happened during all great inflations. We have something. It's three words: all fiat fails. Let me repeat: all fiat fails. There's never been one instance in all recorded monetary history where, when you were taken away from a uh, grounding in gold and or silver. Bimetallic's better than just gold, but I don't have time to go into it. Uh, you get to a basically a runaway inflation and the currency is destroyed. So this is the path we're on. If you look at the 1913 dollar at 100 cents, if you go to the Federal Reserve Board's own website and check out what the 1913 dollar is worth, they'll tell you it's worth about two and a half cents. So if you lost about 97.5% of the value of the U.S. dollar within a little over 100 years. So gold would actually maintain, um, let's say, a policeman on the currency's value, but it doesn't at certain times in history like we're experiencing. If you want to know what the paper price of gold is, it's a very simple thing. All you have to do is go to the U.S. debt clock and look at what M1 is. And then you go to the treasury and find out there's 265 million ounces of gold purportedly in Fort Knox. So you take the amount of printed money divided by 265 million. You've got the numerator dollars on the top. You've got the ounces of gold at the bottom. You divide and you find out it's over $10,000 for an ounce of gold. And that's just base money. That's currency. That's what's in your pocket. That's your checking account and what you have in foldable money or currency, I should say. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So that highly suggests that at less than 2000, gold has a lot of room to the upside, but you don't see the move in these metals during some of these, let's say financial repressions, Jason, because the government's very good at spoofing the market, telling everybody that inflation is low, making metrics that don't make any sense, doing this hedonic indexing, doing a lot of things that basically ignore the truth. And so people get used to it and you know numbers are numbers. They get the idea, well, I'm making more salary, you know, things can't be too bad. Yeah, prices have gone up for, you know, my automobile and maybe my health insurance, but you know, I could get a better car for the, about the same money I did 10 years ago and you know, a laptop is about half the price that yeah, I bought. Te for. Technology hides a lot of the inflation. I get it. Totally agree with you. In fact, I've expressed it this way that there's this war between bad monetary and fiscal policy and technology. And one is inflationary, the other is deflationary, and they're they're bumping heads, right? Which one will win the war? I don't know. I mean, we we see all this asset inflation all around us. We see the cost of medical care, 
college is complete ripoff. Everybody knows that by now. At least that, at least people have finally figured that one out. The price of housing is expensive. All of these things, and it's hard for people to make sense of it, isn't it? Very difficult because you do get these cross currents. And thank you for chiming in. So what happens is as the currency depreciates more and more, more and more people wake up. And in one place, it's really hard to hide is food. So people, everybody has to eat, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. So when you go to the grocery store and you notice, you know, on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, some goods that you buy, you know, almost every trip to the grocery store continuing to go up in noticeable amounts, meaning like 20 uh, percent or whatever, people really catch on. And anyone that has any savings basically starts to think about what's happening to their purchasing power. And what they'll do is move into buying, you know, another case of tuna fish as a, as a hedge or, you know, more cereal or whatever. And the other thing about inflation is that through all inflations and especially in more modern times is a good trick that's done often. And you know, this Jason is that box of cereal will cost the same price, but instead of being 20 ounces, it's now 14 ounces. I know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't notice that. So there's a lot of trickery going on, but why isn't the price of gold doing anything significant? And even silver, I, I mean, for decades, I've heard the gold bugs, the silver bugs talk about how we're going to see this big run up. And it, it, it just seems like either the powers that be are so good at manipulating it, or the market just doesn't recognize it. And maybe all that attention has been directed to Bitcoin. I, I'm not sure. But what, what do you say? Well, thanks. I think you gave a good precursor to it. I think it's both. I think, one, there's a lot of diversion, you know, crypto this and crypto that. So a lot of money that probably go into the metals have gone into the cryptocurrency. I'd call it almost a mania at this point. Not that Bitcoin's not going to be worth a million. I don't know. But what I do know is that one is a diversion. And the other one is lack of knowledge. You know, the people don't understand money. They don't really understand the difference between something the government tells them is money, which is currency that can be printed to infinity, and an ounce of silver or an ounce of gold that's traditionally, over a long period of time, held its value against all commodities. So it's an education process. But I think what's going to happen is as the general markets deteriorate, meaning the bond market and stock market, you're going to see people seeking what is real. And since everything else is pretty much overpriced, you will see a run to gold like you've probably never seen before. But that's my take. I mean, I'm old school and you know, I went through the 1970s and watched the whole thing happen. And it really looked to me like in January 21st, 1980, when gold peaked, we were pretty near a currency crisis and gold was signaling that the US dollar was gonna fail. And Volcker came in and said, I'm putting interest rates up to 20%. Well, at the time, 20% was like mafia money. I mean, that would be a loan shark on the street that would demand you to pay 20%. Right. And so yes, the collapse meant inflationary collapse, and then Volcker broke the back of inflation with high interest rates, right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. The best thing you could have done is what one of my friends did. He sold all of his gold and bought the long bond. So for 30 or 40 years, he's gotten a you know, coupon of like 17, 18, 19%. And as interest rates go down, bond prices go up. So that was like the absolute best investment you could have made in the latter part of the 19 or early in the 1980s. When, so, once it, you know. so, so give us if you if you know them, and I, I don't know if you have these offhand, but can you 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 said a moment ago that gold and silver have held their value against real things? Can you share with us any examples of that? Yeah. Uh, you know, what an ounce of silver would have purchased before or a silver coin versus what it buys today or gold or, or whatever. Just any good examples like that? Yeah, let me um, share my screen here. So this chart was published in Forbes magazine after Warren Buffett announced that he had bought 130 million ounces of physical silver. And, and most and of that what, silver what, came... What year is that? 1999. Okay. So... This is a very, very interesting chart because it takes the inflation lie out of the price of silver. So what that means is that a $400 back in 1344 is the same as $400 in 2004. So now we can get an inflation adjusted price for silver. 
And then as I, I did a lecture on this or actually a podcast recently, a few weeks back. And what I pointed out was in 1344 to 1544, the average price of silver was well above $400 the ounce. So the problem with silver, if you want to call it a problem, is when silver is equal to gold. So if silver is treated like gold as a monetary asset and it's only money, it performs pretty well relative to gold. But when it's treated as just a commodity, it doesn't do that well. So if you go these 200 years, silver is above 400. And by the way, the all-time high inflation adjusted was $806 an ounce back in 1477. So we had that 200 years or so of $400 silver, and then it dropped down in this range here, and it maintained about $200 an ounce from roughly 1584 to, we'll call it 1764. And then it dropped again, and we were around $70 an ounce in 1804 to 1904. So for 100 years, silver's purchasing power, real true price, inflation adjusted was about $70. So during the crime of 1873, right about this point where my cursor is, silver was demonetized. The bankers went on a gold-only standard, and you couldn't use silver in monetary transactions for about four years. And during that time, silver basically plummeted and never really came back for quite some time. And then what you had in the 1980s was the Hunt brothers came in. You got the spike high. You saw silver around 50 and I've been studying the Hunt brothers lately. It's a very interesting story. Yeah. Very. And so then you come back down after the sell-off. And, 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 and by the way, I should mention, for those who don't know, the Hunt brothers story is about them trying to corner the silver market. So, yeah. So this gives you a pretty good picture of what silver does when it's valued as money. Okay. Uh, and when it's not, you can see it gets these very low valuations. Buffett bought right here. Mm -hmm. at the, I mean, not the exact day he was buying it over time, so it wouldn't move the price, but he bought most of it under $5 a ounce, which okay, on so, an inflation, so Buffett's trade in 1999 was good then, you're saying, right? It's the best you could ever uh, do. He okay. bought silver at the lowest price on an inflation-adjusted basis it's ever been in since the 1300s. Got it. Okay, so what is the point of this chart, though? What is the thesis? What are you telling us to do? Is there an action step here? Bring it home for us. Well, one, Buffett's a value investor. So he saw value. Okay. Silver at that ridiculously low price is a value investment. Okay. He knew but, it was but going But that was high. 22 years ago. Absolutely. So what yeah. did we, what, where are we today? What does it mean? What do we do today? Well, what we've already discussed, Jason, what it means is that as this inflation becomes more viable to the average person, they'll start to seek ways to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wealthier will look to gold and the less wealthy that have savings will move to silver. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way it happens is, you know, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. Most people don't know monetary history. They don't really care about monetary history. And they really have no conception of gold and silver. It's not anything that you hear on the Wall Street talking heads ever. I mean, very rarely, let me put it that way. So people have to wake up word of mouth. But what's happening is we're seeing that. This is what gives me faith that the next leg up is going to be rather spectacular because the Wall Street Silver Group has gone from a startup to, I think there's 40, 45,000 people in that group. And these people are mostly younger and they're educating each other about the merits of an honest financial system. Mm -hmm. And so they understand that silver cannot be inflated away. It's always going to be an ounce of silver. Okay, what varies so is how much currency is printed against that ounce. Right. So do you prefer silver over gold as a metal? I do because it's like a stock buyback program. I mean, in gold, you know, every ounce that's ever been found is still above ground. Practically speaking, there's mm -hmm. some lost, but most of it still exists. In silver, you got a buyback program where 50% of the stock is bought by industry every year. So half of the silver demand comes from industry. Right. So because, it only leaves silver the, is really an industrial metal. Gold hardly is at all, right? Correct. I mean, I would say silver is a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. It's 50% money and 50% industrial use. Okay. Talk to us about the gold to silver ratio. It's been pretty out of whack for quite a long time, hasn't it? Yeah, it depends. You know, there's a lot of arguments both sides. I could take either argument. My argument is on the pro side, meaning that 
Silver has been money longer, more places than gold ever has. More transactions have taken place in silver than gold historically. And it's the merchant class. It's the people. It's the shopkeepers and it's the people. And that's silver. As far as um, gold goes, it's usually big transactions, nation state to nation state, you know, my warships for your gold or that type of thing. That actually carries over into the modern world. I mean, if you look at the UK, which was, you know, the sun never sets on the British Empire, they had all the gold and all the means of production. That's true capital, means of production. And then when it shifted after the war to the, Amer- to the Americans, then it, all the gold basically moved to America and also mm-hmm. the means of production. So we were providing the world with all, the, not all, but a great percentage of the produced goods. Now what we've seen is China has really scarfed up a great deal of gold, probably more than they say publicly. That country is the one that makes most goods, not all, but a great percentage of them. So this cycle, you know, the old adage, follow the money, like you do with what you do, Jason. I mean, it's pretty easy to just be objective and say, well, where's the money going? Well, in this case, we're talking about real money, gold. Gold went from the UK to the United States to China. So it's pretty easy to get a a big picture on what's happening. On the silver side, since no one in the banking system considers it to be money, even though a lot of investors do, or at least consider it to be a hedge against the monetary crisis, we have a lower price. For example, if any bank decided to take on silver as a monetary asset, I don't think you could put the price on silver because it would have to represent, you know, a pretty good percentage. And so everyone just sort of leaves it alone because they know what would happen. So silver is just given kind of the short shrift. People are taught, you know, oh, those silver guys, they, you know, and it's volatile, very volatile. But what happened uh, in 1980 when silver in 1979 went from $6 to $50 in one year, so that's the kind of moves that silver can make. And you usually see a great percentage of the gain come in the last part of the bull market. That's where we are right now. We hit a $12 intraday low in 2020 March. And now 2021, we're at like 26 or so. So it's more than double, but that's just the warm up. I really do think we'll see at least $100 silver probably over the next two to three years. Well, that's pretty significant gains. So you believe inflation is coming, as do I. How bad do you think it'll get? Uh, bad enough for people to protect themselves with, with uh, precious metals. I don't think I don't buy into the hyperinflation, really. I don't think we're going Zimbabwe. I think we're going to have enough inflation. The advanced capital markets, and there's none more advanced than the I got my the, Zimbabwe dollars treasure, right here. Exactly. The <laughs> trillions treasury. of them. <laughs> <laughs> the treasury market. So If interest rates are forced higher by the market, and of course the Fed wants to control interest rates, they're very matter of fact about it now. But if they're unable to, and there's a case to be made that they would be unable to, then as interest rates are forced higher, then bond prices deteriorate. So if you had, let's say, a spike, and these days wouldn't have to be, you know, nearly what Volcker did, you know, say 10%, that would probably crush the market. Um, not not probably, it would crush the market. What would be the outcome? Nobody knows. Could we survive it? Probably. But bond values would be deflationary because you would lose a great deal percentage-wise of what the bonds would sell for. You'd also have to pay more interest to savers that just put you know their money in the bank, so to speak. And so that's deflationary. And so you could have these countervailing forces we talked about earlier, where technology things are less and, you know, foods more and you know how do you strike a balance and figure out what's really going on and the answer is as this thing unravels further and further the market will let us know but to predict the chance of a debt liquidating or a depression like the 30s is just about zero and here's why a friend of mine did a study on every great inflation and what he discovered was any time it's been an unbacked currency you've had a inflationary bailout If you had a gold currency, you could have a a deflation like in the 30s. Remember, in the 30s, it was a gold-backed currency. Now, you know, the executive order that everyone says confiscated the gold. Well, gold was paid for at a low price, and then it was revalued at a higher price. No one got 
you know, their gold stolen from well, them. Well, yeah, it was, it was like $21, and then you got, and then they revalued it at $33, I think, right? At 35 yes, yeah. that's right. So that's the story. I think we're approaching a significant point. It's really about, again, I'm repeating, but it's about awareness. I think when people are aware of what's really going on and know something about what asset classes, and really a lot of it has to do with the modern systems, you know, with the internet, all of a sudden, if silver just takes off, people that never even know how to spell the word silver will start seeing it in different programs. They'll see it in the chat room. They'll see it, you know, a video made from someone that does. And, talk and about that's cats. that's kind of what's happening with cryptocurrency and real exactly. estate and stocks right. now. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, and it's a small market. That's the other part. The amount of silver and gold that's available. The reason they're called precious metals is they are precious. I mean, every ounce of gold ever mined for the last 5,000 years would fit into three Olympic sized swimming pools. Right. And, and the amount of the gold supply increases at about two and a half percent per year, I believe, right? Yeah, it varies one and a half to two, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about silver? Is it is it the same kind of ratio? Well, silver's eaten up. So you can get periods where there's a surplus and then there's a deficit. We had a deficit from uh, 1990 to 2006, where we took the above ground stockpile of silver from 2 billion ounces and ate up 1.5 billion of those ounces and got down to 500 million ounces. Mm -hmm. And with the China boom, there was a lot of industrial demand for all commodities, especially metals and other things, concrete, you name it. And so that, that caused a lot of increase in mining and that took the silver price, or took the silver production much higher, which brought the price down um, over time. And so you got more or less a balance. I mean, most economic systems strive for balance. Mm -hmm. They're short of, a, of housing in a certain area and a big workforce moving into the area. You know, there's a demand for housing and some contractor or contractors are going to build more houses or more apartments. I, I just wish the precious metals produced income like rental properties do and had tax benefits like rental properties do, you know, then I would be all in on, on, on you know, uh, other asset classes like that. But, you know, we didn't talk, you talked about the two major precious metals, but what about the other two? What about platinum and palladium? Do you have any thoughts on that before we go? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I think what's really a good study is palladium. Because palladium it has used. gone up. I mean, I made yeah. money on my palladium. <laughs> I tell yeah. you that I had a little bit of it. Not, I mean, listen, I'm not a metals investor per se. Right. I've got a little bit for insurance, sure. uh, like I do in other things. But uh, but I couldn't believe palladium. What it did, it was really incredible. Well, that's a proof to me, and I think anyone else that studies the markets, uh, Jason. I mean, you had palladium at a few hundred dollars an ounce, yeah. and now it's almost three thousand ounces. It exceeded platinum. By far. Yeah. yeah. So what's happened is it's a supply demand truth. Unlike the gold and silver price, which is basically a price of the contract. It's a derivatives price. Whereas a palladium, it's hardcore, you know, cash on the barrel head, as they say, palladium or no palladium. I don't want any, you know, paper. And so palladium is a very good indicator that the physical market can control the price. And because it's demanded in catalytic converters to such an extent that the price, even though it's been as high as like, oh, 22, 2300, it's already crept up to like 2800 because there is a demand to physically have it. When that happens in the silver market, it will take off because they'll, there's the inability to satisfy people with a piece of paper that says silver on it they're going to demand the real thing. And when that happens, uh, it will spill over into gold or vice versa. Gold could lead silver. I'm not sure which way it'll go. Platinum, I am bullish on platinum because the Platinum Guild said that they are going to be replacing some of the palladium and catalytic converters this year and moving on. And that's a truth. Most people are taught that palladium is for ice engine, internal combustion, gasoline engines. And uh, platinum is only for diesels, but it's not true. You can use either one of the PGMs in a catalytic converter. It really doesn't matter. You'd have to take down the line, you know, the tooling, and have to retool. But, you know, when you've got 2,800 for one metal and you got 1,100 for the other metal. It's worth it and to you, do that. You know, you move it across hundreds of thousands of units. Sure. You know, it's probably worth retooling. 
Right. Absolutely. Very interesting. Sum it all up with any thoughts, give out your website and let's wrap it up. Well, first of all, I'll compliment you. I've followed you. I'm on your mailing list and what you do in real estate, I think is top notch. So let me shout that out to you. Thank you. Second. Yeah. And you find real value. I really like people that find value. It's easy to get hung up in the, uh, in the meme of, you know, this or that crypto or this or that housing development or this or that. And you take a very uh, methodical, uh, the hope of sounds like a common, you take a very objective view, yeah. you know, does this property have value or does it not? And I really appreciate that. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I got to say, I'm really worried that the crypto world is like the tulip mania. <laughs> it's just, you know, that's just crazy. But but go ahead, please. Yeah. So the best place to go is my main website is themorganreport.com. Sign up for a free newsletter. Go to the blog. Also, if you go to the about uh, tab, you can see a biography of me. Big deal. But further down that page is a movie called The Four Horsemen Film. That's an hour and a half movie for free. Everybody should watch that because that is showing you how the monetary cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. We are at the end of the age of empire. There's nothing that can stop it. And knowledge is something that you can use to have a right attitude. So if you're, I love the expression, chance favors the prepared mind. Yes. You watch that movie, you'll have a prepared mind. It's okay. not going to undo a lot of what's coming our way, but at least you can be mentally prepared for it. And it's not going, it's not the end of the world, but it's a huge shift. Yeah. And generally speaking, most people are going to have a lower standard of living, not a higher standard of living. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Yeah, I agree. And probably the only thing that can rescue us from that is some great technology, some great technological innovation that saves us from having that lower standard of living. But at the same time, David, you know, it's really uneven, isn't it? And it's very unfair because some, you know, the wealth gap is just getting insane. I mean, it's just incredible. You know, I look at old movies and old TV shows and what used to be considered rich and wealthy people, like you, they depict those in shows and so forth. And it's nothing compared to today. I mean, these are like plutocrats. Uh, it's just unbelievable. But I got to ask you one more thing before you go. You said the age of empire is over. And do you mean that to say that the, the U.S. being the, you know, the big leader of the world is over or all empires are over? I just want to ferret that out a little bit because I think it's an important statement. It is. It's the end of the age of empire basically means the United States, but it also means everyone else. Why? Because mm -hmm. the dollar is the reserve currency of everybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And of course, the BRICS nations have tried to mitigate what's going to happen when the dollar is no longer acceptable. And the bankers want to do a de you know, central bank digital currency, and they want to get that in there before this dollar goes to, in theory, absolute zero. It won't. They will put in a new monetary system before that happens. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be for the benefit of you and me, Jason. It's going to be the benefit of the bankers. And if I just might add on, because I respect your thinking ability so much, there's a movie, a documentary called I Am. Mm -hmm. And in that movie, they talk about um, the wealthy. And in the 30s, people thought people that were that extremely wealthy had a mental illness, that you <laughs> had to have something wrong with you to want to have that much for yourself. Right. So this is how society changes. Now it's like, who could be a billionaire and have all this pile of stuff and be at the top of the mountain waving their flag saying, look at me, look at me, I've got all this stuff, look at how many billion or look at how many crypto or look at how many whatever. And we need to rebalance it. Yeah. Nature loves balance. And I think we're gonna get a monetary rebalance in here whether we want it or not. Study, be educated, don't fret, take appropriate action. 10% in the metals is probably more than enough for most people. Don't worry about the interest rate. And I did have to say one thing, if you go to the, uh, URL ag.load.1. That's ag.load.one. You can contribute silver or gold if you so choose and get gold or silver as, I don't know if I'm allowed to say interest, but as, a, as it's tokenized, you actually earn rewards that are convertible to real metal. <clears throat> so, you, so there is a place you can do it. So sort of entering into the kind of the crypto sphere a little bit, right? Is that what you're right? Saying? Yes, yeah. it's a crypto sphere with utility that's real money. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd have to read the whole website. There's some pretty good videos on there. I don't want to push it too much. I am an ambassador. I have contributed my own silver. 
to the project. And for me, my goal is really to get the truth out and to get as many people tuned in to what's taking place with their purchasing power over the next few years and what they can do to protect themselves. I look at totally as an adjunct to metal in your hand. Right. You know, like you showed the Zimbabwe currency, you know, you want real silver, real gold that you can hold on to. Yeah. But if you had X amount, you could take one tenth of X and put it in a digital format and see how it goes. Sure. And so far the program is doing quite well. And it's going to be tied to a debit card. Uh, they already have a virtual debit card, which I've tested a few times. It works fine. So there's a lot to be said about a crypto coupled with honest money. It's happening. They're not the only one. Mm -hmm. David, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And uh, happy investing. And uh, let's, let's hope people get a clue about inflation and monetary policy and really start paying attention to this stuff. It's vital. Thank you.